Hi, my name is Ujashi and I am an MCAT tutor here at Shamasian Consulting. Today I will be going through a lights and optics physics passage. Um, this will be a shorter passage, but it will still be good content review. With that said, let's go ahead and get started. So here is the passage, um, starting with this first paragraph. Contact lenses are highly useful when investigating the structure of the animal eye. Placing a small, con soft, placing a soft contact lens on the eyeball prevents dehydration of the cornea and limits the effects of any naturally occurring geometrical aberrations on the lens that may affect the resolution of a retinal image. So it looks like this is just background information talking about contact lenses. Lenses are, um, or the eye commonly comes up in discussions about lenses in physics. Um, so just getting an idea, um, the cornea is the the part of the eye that, um, that prote it protects the eye. It's the part that light first hiss hits um, and it bends the light. And then the lens of the eye is what basically changes shape in order to focus the light on the retina, which is um, the back part of the eye. This is stuff that we, we don't go over it in physics, but it does come up in psychology. But the back of the eye is where the photoreceptors are, so the lights, um, the rods and cones. And so basically this is just giving a little bit of a background on the eye and what contact lenses can do. Moving forward, um, researchers seeking to create low-cost customizable contact lenses investigate a new procedure for creating and shaping hydrogel lenses. To do so, a solution was prepared by mixing two hydroxyethyl methacrylate with inhibitor removal beads. After filtering out the beads, a cross-linking agent, deionized water, and activator were stirred into the solution. The solution was poured into molds and round indentations were made with six millimeter ball bearings. Okay, so um, there's a lot of words, but it's basically describing how they created the lenses. And um, you don't have to worry too much about it, um, but you know, you should have the understanding, right, that what hydroxy is, right? So that's going to be an OH group, um, ethyl is going to be a CH2, CH3 group, and then meth is going to be a CH3 group. Um, you don't have to know what acrylate is but it's basically talking about the process of filtering and removing things um in order to create these hydro lenses right and hydro means water which it makes sense why they're using deionized water and why they're using why they have oh groups okay so let's go ahead and continue. To test the functionality of these fabricated contact lenses, the indented sections of hydrogen were cut out and compared to industrially available contact lenses. The results are shown in figure one. So this is key, it's sort of introducing the experiment, um, chem, phys, bio, biochem, and even psych, so they're usually surrounding some sort of experiment that the experimenters are doing. And in this case, the experiment is comparing these new contact lenses with the industrially available contact lenses, right? So in that case, that's going to be the independent variable, right? That's what they're manipulating. Um, figure one, right? So when we are looking at a figure, there are a few things that we want to pay attention to. And uh, this is something I've brought up before, but basically the first thing you want to look at is the title, right? Just to understand what the figure is about, right? So one right here, the title optical properties of the synthesized hydrogel. So even though the experiment is comparing the industrially available and the hydrogel, it looks like this figure is sp specifically focusing on the synthesized hydrogel. Um, and we got two figures here. This first one, right, what you wanna pay attention to next are the axes, right? So we've got wavelength here in nanometers and wavelength is often symbolized with this. And then we've got refractive index here. What, what is refractive index? Um, this comes up when we're talking about light and optics. Um, it's commonly denoted as N. And basically the, um, it's basically N equals C over V, right? Where C is the speed of light in a vacuum and V is a speed of light in this particular medium. So the refractive index gives the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum over the ratio in this particular um, medium. In this case, it's gonna be through the lens, right? So it makes sense to have refractive indexes greater than one. That means that um, 
that means basically the speed of light in a vacuum is faster than in this medium, which makes sense because there's nothing kind of disrupting the tra trajectory of the light in a vacuum. Um, so it looks like here, it looks like there, what you should notice, right? So after looking at the axes um, and, you know, figuring out the variables, so it looks like um, we're looking at refractive in index as dependent on the wavelength of light. And it looks like that as wavelength increases, right, as it gets longer, uh, and remember that wavelength is the distance between one peak to another, right? So if we're looking at this, um, so wavelength would be from here to here, or it would be from here to here, right? That should be the same distance. So as wavelength increases, it looks like refractive index decreases um, since C isn't changing. So it looks like um, it looks like V is getting faster. OK, good. And refractive index or N usually comes up when we're talking about Snell's law. So it's likely that we're going to get a question about Snell's law in the questions. But let's go ahead and look at this next figure. So again, looking at the axes. So this is also looking at wavelength. And then this one is transmission loss, right? So the, that's basically the loss of the intensity um, as, you, as you move forward or as you go through a medium um, or away from the source. Um, we're also sort of seeing this downward trend, um, right? As wavelength increases, transmission loss decreases. Um, you don't, you know, you don't have to specifically calculate out the slope, but you should be able to discern a relative or a specific, uh, a relative trend, right? Whether it's positive correlation, negative correlation, upward, downward, um, that sort of thing, right? So be able to f understand that. And it seems like it's not exactly linear um, in both cases, right? It doesn't, it's not in a straight line. There is, um, there is a curve to it. Okay. All right, so that's kind of all you want to look at when looking at the figure, right? So the title, the axes, the variables, and then the results, right? The general trend. The researchers concluded that this method of production has several advantages, including cost effectiveness, short fabrication periods, and customizability. Further, its behavior was comparable to that of conventional mass produced hydrogen contact lenses. Okay, so they don't they don't show us the actual experiment, but they do tell us the results where basically, okay, like there are advantages, great. Um, this isn't exactly physics related, but it looks like they're giving this a thumbs up. Um, but basically, right, what we want to understand that is we're talking about lenses, we're talking about optics, you know, light, wavelength, understanding the relationship between wavelength and refractive index, between um, wavelength and speed. Um, so that's certain certain things that you should be thinking about as you're going through this passage. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the questions now. Okay, so that was a short passage, but um, it looks like we're going to need a little bit of background information uh, for these questions. But let's go ahead and get started on this first one. Question one, a light ray of 400 nanometers. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight as I'm going. Um, a light ray of... 400 nanometers strikes the contact lens at an incoming angle of 30 degrees to the perpendicular. What is the angle of refraction of this light ray? So it looks like we're given wavelength here. Um, we're given an angle and we're asked about another angle, right? This is angle of incidence. This we're asked about angle of refraction. When, when, Okay, when you see these keywords, right, incoming angle, angle of refraction, you should think Snell's law. And we sort of predicted that as we were going through the passage, right? So what, what was Snell's law? I'll go ahead and write that out. So Snell's law, and try to think it through as I'm writing it down. So Snell's law is N1 sine theta1 equals N N2 sine theta 2. So what does this mean? Um, this is a law that you should have memorized, one of the physics formulas that you should have down. Um, I find it helpful to have a running physics formula sheet that I can always go back to. Um, but yeah, so basically N1 here is going to be the incidence 
uh, the incidence index. Um, so basically, um, the like I mentioned, this was the refractive index. So this is the index or a C over V um, based on where the light is coming from or like the source of the light. In this case, right, so if we were to draw this out, um, the light ray is striking the contact lens, right? So we have a contact lens um, and they don't mention what type of contact lens, but we'll say we have um, a contact lens like this, right? And we've got light striking it. Um, so, and it says it's striking it at an angle of 30 degrees to the perpendicular, right? So if this is the contact lens, it's going to be, this is going to be perpendicular. And so this is going to be 30 degrees, right? So, um, so it's coming in from air. We usually assume that N of air or the index of air is going to be one. So we assume that light travels as fast in air as it does in a vacuum. Okay, and then theta one is going to be the incident angle, right? And so this is going to be the incoming angle. This is going to be 30 degrees. Um, and two is going to be the refractive index, right? So they don't give that here in the problem, but we do know that they give us a wavelength. And if we go back to the figure, they gave us a relationship between the wavelength and the refractive index. So at a wavelength of 400 nanometers, it looks like we've got a refractive index of 1.45. So it's really just putting things together. Um, it's helpful to kind of write down all of the information we have, write down all the information that we're looking for and go from there. So N2 is going to be 1.45 and theta2 is going to be the angle of refraction, which is what we're looking for, right? So that's some number. Um, okay, good. So now it's just a simple plug and chug, right? So we've got one, we can kind of cancel that out. We've got sine 30. You should have certain angles of the unit circle memorized. Um, so sine 30 is gonna be right here and it's going to be the y-axis. You should know that sine 30 is one half. So we've got one half equals 1.45 sine theta two, okay? Um, what we can do, we're just gonna be moving some things around, right? So if we move 1.45, um, if we move it over to this side, right, so it'll be one over two times 1.45. That's about, let's see if I can make some space here. So that's going to be, um, that's going to be one over 2.9. We can, we can kind of, um, we can round that to one, one over three. The MCAT never has such like, precise or um precise number it's usually going to be some approximation you should be able to approximate since we're not able to use a calculator so we can say it's one third equals um sine theta two we're gonna just kind of rearrange it so it's arc sine one third equals theta two right so I don't exactly know what angle that is, but I do know that um, if if third if one half is here, one third is gonna be somewhere here, right? It's 0 0.33, 0 0.15. So it's gonna be close to one half, um, but it's gonna be less. It's gonna be so it's gonna be less than 30 degrees. Um so if we were if we know that's less than 30 degrees, right, we can eliminate A and B. Uh, between 20 degrees and 5 degrees, we know that 0.33 is not too far from 0.5, so it's not going to go all the way down to 5 degrees. So based on these approximations, we can say that theta is going to be 20 degrees. Again, you do not need exact numbers, um, but you should be able to approximate based on um, what you are expected to know, right? So you are expected to know that sine, one half, sine 30 is 1 half, but you don't have to know, right, sine... Um, 20 degrees is one third or close to that. Okay, good. So that's question one. Now question two, the researcher find 
Researchers find that at certain angles, some light passing through the hydrogel lens never crosses the boundary into the eye, but instead reflects off of the boundary between the media. Which of the following best describes this phenomenon? Okay, so sometimes it can be helpful to just draw it out again, right? So in this case, we kind of do this out. What happened was it hit right here and it refracted and then this angle was 20 degrees, right? In this case, what they're saying is that it hit at some angle and what happened that was that it never ended up going on the other side. What happened is just it reflected, right? It just bounced right back. And so what can cause that to happen? And that brings us back to Snell's law, actually. Um, what happens is that at certain angles, um, basically when, when we have certain angles where theta two or the angle of refraction is greater than 90, uh, what happens is we get reflection because we can't have angles greater than 90, right? It, it would just bounce back, right? So that's where reflect, reflection tends to happen. Um, the angle at which this happens, right? So again, if we were to rewrite Snell's law, um, it depends on the incident angle, right? So if this angle surpasses a particular um, threshold, um, we'll get theta two greater than 90 and we'll have reflection. Um, the angle at which that happens is called the critical angle. So these are just a few vocab words you should know. Um, so critical angle is the angle at which this reflection happens. Um, specifically, it's known as total, total internal reflection um, when, when the reflect, refracted angle is greater than 90 degrees, which again, isn't possible. Um, okay, so now looking at the answer choices, well, that first answer choice is exactly what we were talking about. It can be helpful to try to predict the answer before looking at the answer choices because it just makes it so much easier for us. So we know it's A just given this definition, but we can go through the other ones and eliminate them as well, right? So double refraction, that happens when basically there's two indices of refraction in a, um, a medium which causes light to bounce basically in two directions. Um, so basically it bounces like, I mean, or it refracts in two directions. And that usually happens when it's, um, when there's like maybe two different mediums or there's two different um, sources within one medium. Um, the Doppler, okay, so it's not this. Doppler effect, so we, we typically um, relate that to sound, right? So Doppler effect occurs when there is when either the source or the um, the receptor um, is moving and that causes a change in the frequency that is received, right? So, um, so Doppler effect, we tend to think about it in sound, not, we don't, we don't associate it with light so that we can eliminate that based just on that. But it's basically, we should know that Doppler effect is when something is moving, either the source or the receptor, and that causes a change in the frequency that is received. Okay, um, lens aberration. So that's basically the, a deviation of light rays from a single focus. So aberration is basically any deviation from normal. And lens aberration is when it the light basically uh, goes outward away from a single focus. So it's like basically we see and that often, that's often how we see rainbows, right? Where there's lens aberrations because um, the the different wavelengths of light will uh, ref refract in different at different angles. Um, because again, there is that relationship between wavelength and refraction. Okay, good. So we know it's not that either, right? So this is, when it says reflection, um, you know, certain angles, this angle is going to be the critical angle that is known as total internal reflection. All right, let's move on. Which of the following statements about convex contact lenses are true? So convex contact lenses, that um, that's also a converging lens. And so converging lens is basically one 
um, that goes, goes like this. Um, when we think of thin lenses, we basically, we would draw it out like that, but that's going to be a converging lens. Well, we should know. So always, no matter what, um, so when we're talking about lenses and mirrors, you should have this formula memorized. And this formula can help you answer a lot of questions. You don't really have to memorize um, specific rules or anything. You can just use this formula, plug in numbers, and that can help you. But remember the formula 1 over O plus 1 over I equals 1 over F, right? Where O is the object distance, I is the distance of the resulting image, and F is the focal length. Um, and the focal length is dependent on the lens. With a convert with any lens, O, the object distance is always going to be greater than zero, right? So this is always going to be positive. With converging lenses, um, F is going is also going to be greater than zero, right? So lenses have two focuses, right? They they have one in the front and one in the back. Um, for converging ones, we we use uh, the F in the front, and that's going to be positive, right? So knowing that both of these are positive. If, um, and with with the contact lens, right, um, usually the object is going to be past the focal length. So if we have, right, if we were to rearrange this to find out I, right, so 1 over F minus 1 over O equals 1 over I, and knowing that O is always greater than F, we're going to have a positive 1 over I, which means that I is going to be positive. Um, so, so one is right just because we know that it's a converging contact lens. Um, so with that, we can eliminate B. That's it. Um, we know that it's going to be, if it's positive, that means it's a real image. If it's negative, it's going to be a virtual image. So we know that it's going to be a real image. We should also know is that real images are also, are always inverted. And the reason for that is the relationship between the distance and the um and basically the height so when i is positive oh when i is positive hi is going to be negative so since i is positive hi is going to be negative so we're going to get inverted real images so we know two is right so with that we can eliminate a um we can't eliminate c either c or d so looking at c the contact lens produces a negative image distance well, we, we figured out that I is positive, which produces a real image. So actually C is, I mean, number three is not going to be correct. And that is how we get to C, right? So we eliminate the wrong answer choices. Um, but again, it's helpful to t think through it before you look at the, um, the answer choices. Okay, good. Um... Question four, which is the following phenomena could be responsible for the transmission loss at higher wavelengths, right? So transmission loss, again, is going to be the loss of intensity. Um, in this case, right, there, there are two things we need to think about, right? We need something, we need a statement that is correct, but we also need a statement that um, explains why there's transmission loss at higher wavelengths, right? A lot of times we will see statements that are correct, but they don't necessarily answer the question. Um, so we can go through each of them, um, and in this case, we can't exactly pre um, predict the answer, but we can go through. So, so A, the Doppler effect. So again, that's we usually associate that with sound, um, but which results in higher aberrations at lower wavelengths. We don't associate it with light, so we're in, that's not going to be a good explanation, and it's not going to be a correct explanation or a correct statement uh, related to the Doppler effect. So we can eliminate A. Reduction of power, which comes from increasing the focal length of a lens. So it is, you should know that it is true that increase, increasing the focal length of a lens does reduce power because there is that inverse relationship between power and um, focal length where D is going to be power and it's going to be 1 over focal length in meters. Um, so that is true, but that doesn't necessarily explain the transmission loss at higher wavelengths because... Um, the focal length is inherent to the lens that doesn't that has nothing to do with the wavelength of light that we hit it with right so that's not going to explain it 
selective absorption, which filters out wavelengths that are not important for retinal imaging. Um, this, well, it, okay, so it makes sense. We actually, we don't know that higher wavelengths are going to be not important. There is no indication that higher wavelengths are not important or lower wavelengths are, um, let's see, higher wavelengths results in decreased transmission loss, right? So we don't know that lower wavelengths are going to be not important. We can't actually make this relationship, right? Selective absorption will filter out wavelengths. So that is a correct statement, but that can't explain the transmission loss at higher wavelengths. Um, and then D, lens aberration res results in the diffuse scattering of light. So again, as we mentioned, lens aberration is that diffusion of light or scattering of light rays away from a single focus. And um, any real world lens is going to exhibit lens aberration. So it is correct, right? It's a correct statement. Lens aberration does result in a diffuse scattering of light. Does it explain transmission loss at higher wavelengths? Um, well, if you think about it, right, um, when we have higher wavelengths, we can have larger amounts of aberration, right? And that can result in an increased uh, dispersion of light, which could result in increasing transmission loss. So that makes more sense. It definitely makes more sense than the other answer choices. Um, we're always looking for the best answer choice. In this case, we can get we can get to the answer by making the least amount of prediction, right? It's the simplest explanation for this, um, this outcome. So D seems to be the correct answer. It seems to be better a better answer choice than the other answer choices. Okay, good. Okay, last question. What is the appropriate energy of a single photon uh, of the light that produces the lowest measured refractive index. Okay, so energy of a single photon, we should know the equation for that, E equals HF. We don't have any of these right now, right? So let's try to derive it from what we, well, we do have H, right? We know, you should know that H is 6. 6.6 times 10 to the power of negative 34 joules times second. Always make it a habit to write down units just to make sure that you are canceling out units. You end up with the right units, especially when there are units in the answer choice, right? So we have H, we don't have F, but we do have wavelength. And we do know that there is a relationship between wavelength and frequency, right? Where V or C equals, um, in this case, we can C equals wavelength times frequency, okay? And we're looking at the wavelength at the lowest measured refractive index. So in this case, so remember, so these, it's important to point out that the experiments are these dots, right? So the lowest measured one was actually right here. And that's going to be about 1.43, okay? Um, oh, and then we're actually looking for the wavelength. So right here, that's going to be about 680. You don't have to be perfect. You can just approximate. Um, so we have a wavelength here of 680. And remember to put down units, right? So nanometers. Um, you should know that the speed of light um, in air is going to be 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second, so we're, we're going to have to convert this to meters, um, and then frequency is going to be per second, right? So first we have to figure out what frequency is. Once we get frequency, we can figure out energy. Um, so it can be helpful to sort of, we can even plug in, right? So to get frequency from this, we would do um, C over wavelength equals frequency. We can plug that into this equation. So we've got 6.6 .6 times 10 to the power of negative 34. Again, always put down your units. Joules times second times um, three times 10 to the power of eight meters per second. And here, let's convert this over here. So 680 nanometers. You should know your conversions between nanometers or um, 
between different dimensions, right? So nanometers to meters, that's going to be times um, 10 to the power of negative 9, right? So 680 times 10 to the power of negative 9 meters and um it can a lot it's good practice to put it in scientific notation because that's often what our answers are going to be so we got 6.8 times 10 to the power of negative 7 right because we moved the decimal point two places this way okay good so now we got 3 times 10 to the power of 8 over 6.8 times 10 to the power of negative seven meters. All right, so there's a few ways to go about it, but just looking at it, um, we could do three divided by six, three divided by seven, we might get an iffy answer, but it looks like these numbers are pretty close, close enough to cancel out, right? 6.6, 6.8. Again, MCAT math is never gonna be super precise, um, and so we're okay to do a little bit of approximating right but make sure not to forget about these um these powers right so now we've got basically um 10 to the power of negative 34 times 3 times 10 to the power of 8 sorry i forgot to put my units here joules times second meters per second divided by 10 to power of negative seven, All right? So if we were to bring that up, we got. Um, remember, when you are dividing, you subtract. When you're add, when you're multiplying, you add for exponents. So, I guess we can we can add these two first, right? So negative thirty four plus eight, that's going to be um, negative. That's going to be. I'm going to go ahead and erase a little bit here just to give us some space, okay? And so that's going to be three times 10 to the power of negative 26 divided by 10 to the power of negative seven. And in this case, right, we can cancel out the meters, I mean, sorry, the seconds. And then once we divide, we can cancel out the meters, but here we've got joules times meters um, over meters. And so negative, negative 26 minus negative seven, so that's gonna be a plus. So then we're gonna end up with three times 10 to the power of negative 19, cancel out meters, and we end up with joules, right? Which is exactly what these answer choices are in, which is good. That means we did our math right. So we end up with three times 10 to the negative nine meters and it looks like A is exactly it, and it's the quote, like there's nothing else close, right? Which is why I said you can usually approximate. Um, if you have time, this might be a question that you want to flag just to double check later, but it looks like we're good, and that is it for this passage. Um, hopefully this was helpful. If you enjoyed this walkthrough, be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss out on our future MCAT videos. Be sure to also check out our high yield strategies in our MCAT 528 series and click the link in the description to sign up for our practice questions so that you get every last bit of practice in before test day. Good luck studying!